Okay, so it looks like I've already collected a bunch of homework assignments here. Are there any other papers for the uh, homework 12? All right. Um, I'll print out the next homework assignment and bring it to class on Wednesday. I'll also post it on MU Online uh, this afternoon in case you'd like to take a look at what the next assignment is going to be before I give you the papers on Wednesday. Um, oh, hold on a minute. Mm. No, you've just given me homework 11, right? Yeah, okay, homework 11. So homework 12 is due a week from today, and I'll bring, that, um, I'll bring the paper to class on Wednesday and post the PDF of it today. Um, I've started to get a few questions on the project, and that's great. I'm glad to see that some of you are making progress on that. And uh, please, at any time, feel free to come see me in my office or send me an email, and I'll do my best to help you out. What we're going to be doing today is called break-even analysis, and this is included on the final exam. Uh, the final exam is comprehensive, meaning that the entire semester is fair game. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait the, uh, the second half of the class since we had our second uh, midterm exam on the final. So there are going to be more questions from now till the end of the semester on the final as compared to the earlier material. Um, just by nature of the course, it would be impossible to give a non-comprehensive final because you know, we keep doing, for example, present worth analysis in most of the stuff that we do. So you can't really separate it and make it non-comprehensive, but I do want to give more questions on the stuff you haven't been tested on before. And, you know, also about the final, one nice thing there is that we're going to have two hours for the final exam instead of just 50 minutes. And so that'll take some of the time pressure off, and then at the same time, it'll allow me to ask a greater variety of questions on the final exam. Because, you know, with the midterm exam, there's only three problem-solving questions that can be given. And so if, you know, if you're really strong at one thing that wasn't asked, then that kind of, uh, you know, is an unfortunate consequence of how limited the uh, time is for our exam. So I hope that you know, those problems will disappear for the final. All right, well, let's uh, talk about break-even analysis. Here is a picture of Twinkies being made in a factory. I was, in, I was uh, I'm sure lots of you heard in the news a few years ago that like Twinkies went out of business. They got bankrupt, and there was like a threat that they weren't going to be made anymore, but then somebody bought the bankrupt company and started the production line back up again. So our favorite food is saved for now. Um, but think about when you're producing Twinkies, uh, what the costs are. You know, what goes into what you pay for a box of Twinkies. There's two broad categories of costs, and uh, the first category is called fixed costs. The fixed costs are the expenses that a company faces regardless of how many things that it's making. And so it could be related to the, uh, the rent of a company, the machinery that's there, um, the cost of the salary for the administrators because regardless of whether they're main, making things or if the production line is shut down they have to continue paying their rent. It can also include computer systems, insurance and so fixed costs are those things that don't vary depending on uh, how much is being made or the, the productivity level of a company. In contrast to that though are the variable costs. And so when a business is making more of something, its variable costs will go up. So for the Twinkies, for instance, the money that they spend on the cellophane packaging, the materials like flour and sugar and diglycerides, all of that stuff, you're going to have to buy more of it as you make more Twinkies. Packaging materials, shipping costs, and the salaries of the laborers who are there, uh, who are working on an hourly basis. So that's the difference between fixed costs and variable costs. Well, here's a graphical representation of, on the x-axis, how many things are being made, and on the y-axis, the cost per year when you're making that many things. And you can see that one of the lines is flat, this black line that says fixed cost, fixed FC. So the fixed costs, as we've just discussed, don't change depending on how many units per year are being made. But in contrast to that, this uh, 
black line that's inclined, it starts at zero and then it's working its way up. The variable costs, there's a linear relationship here that's just saying if you're making 100 things per year, then your variable costs will be half of what they would be if you were making 200 things per year. And so that's a linear relationship. And when we add the two cost categories together, that's where the total costs come in. That blue line is saying when you've added the overall total costs, that comes from the variable and the fixed. So you can see here it's bold. That's a linear cost relationship. Now consider this other graph. It also has both fixed and variable cost, but there's a curvature to the line. There's a curvature to the variable cost line. Anybody have an idea of why there could potentially be a, uh, a non-linearity like is illustrated here? What would make it so that as you're making more and more things, your variable costs are changing? Any thoughts about that? All right, when you buy in bulk, it's cheaper. So say, for instance, I needed to buy a bag of sugar because I'm going to make Twinkies at my house and start selling them at the grocery store. I go to the store, I could buy a bag of sugar for like $2.50, right? The company that's making Twinkies isn't going to Kroger and paying $2.50 a bag for sugar. I mean, they're buying it by the rail car and they're getting a really good deal for it because they're buying in bulk. And so you'll notice the curvature of this is saying that the more units per year that you're buying, the flatter the variable cost curve becomes. It's because your variable cost per unit is decreasing the more you make. So the factors that cause this linearity are, uh, it, it could be related to um, you know, bulk discount. And sometimes there's a nonlinearity where it actually becomes more expensive with the, uh, the larger volumes. And so cases where it becomes actually more expensive is if you're starting to have to pay uh, overtime for your laborers. So maybe you, uh, you can run a shift, you know, 40 hours per week, you have to pay people $10 per hour. But then when you start working them overtime, your labor costs go up. And so that's an illustration of how increasing the number of units per year could actually be more costly than, uh, than cheaper <coughs> per unit. Okay, so we've talked about total costs are fixed plus variable. What this is showing is um, the, the line above here is showing the, um, the total costs over increased units sold. And so the, uh, from zero up to 2,400, that represents the fixed costs for this business. Their fixed costs are uh, 2,400, and it looks like these are thousands. So this is their fixed cost. The intercept with the y-axis is the fixed cost, and then their variable cost is why it keeps getting higher. The other line, this other black line that's beneath it at first, is the revenue line. You can see the label here. It's saying it's the revenue line. And so when you sell zero items per month, you have zero revenue. And then if you sell 15 units per month, They've got a thousand and so on. So this line where they intersect, who can tell me what's the interpretation of when the cost line is intersecting with the revenue line? Breaking even. What does that mean, breaking even? Okay, so the expenses and the revenue are equal. Um, profit is what's beyond that. When you have more revenue than expense, finally you're starting to make a profit. And so this break-even line is the first time that the company is beginning to see a profit. In any volume below, in this case it looks like 60 units per month, if they're selling 45 units per month, their business is in trouble because their revenue is less than their total cost. So they're going to go out of business eventually. But if they can sell 60 or more, then they're past the break-even point and they're starting to make a profit. So that intersection line is really important. And in class on Wednesday, we're going to talk more about the theory of break-even, revenue, profit. But for today, what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at uh, comparing alternatives on the basis of break-even. 
So I hope all of you understand that what break even is, is it's where you start to be profitable. There's another way of looking at break even though, and that is where one alternative begins to be better than another alternative. So what this is showing is for a given choice, what happens if variable costs are reduced? Remember, variable costs are the expenses that have to do with um, each additional unit that you're making, the added cost that goes along with that. So in the case of making Twinkies, sugar or packaging or labor costs. So to begin with, let's say that we had um, this first TC line. The total costs were some amount because we had relatively high variable costs originally. But then we got a discount. Our sugar supplier lowered their prices or whatever the case may be. So this light blue line is when we had lowered variable costs. Now what that means is it's going to change the break-even point. It's going to shift it to the left. Originally, we had to sell this many things to break even, our QBE, back when we had the higher variable costs. But when we get cheaper, variable costs, that shifts the break-even point to the left. So that means simply we don't have to sell as many things to cover our costs because our costs are lower. We haven't changed our revenue. It's just uh, simply that the costs are lower than they were previously. So you can calculate the break-even cost to find out uh, how many you have to sell by dividing the fixed cost by the revenue per unit and the variable cost per unit. So the revenue per unit is the sales price per item and the V, the variable cost per unit, only has to do with uh, the costs of, that go into each additional, to each additional item, not, not including the fixed costs such as the, uh, the rent, the insurance, and all those other things that go into fixed cost. So this is an important effect for you to be aware of what happens when variable costs go down. The break-even point moves to the left. Okay, now here this graph illustrates the main point of what we're going to be calculating today when we get into the Excel. When you have two alternatives, you have to know which one to choose and uh, that can often change depending on um, how busy your business is going to be. Like you're trying to decide if you're in the construction industry, should you get the small mini backhoe or the large full-size backhoe? You know, it depends. Should you spend for the more expensive one that has a larger volume bucket and can maybe, maybe excavate more quickly? What this is showing is it's illustrating two different options, one of which has a higher fixed cost. Alternative two, as you can see from where it intercepts the y-axis, it has a higher initial purchase price, but for whatever reason, it, it costs less to operate it. So the variable costs are, uh, are more shallow. That's the, that line is relatively flat compared to alternative one. Alternative one has a low fixed cost, but a high variable cost. One place that you see this kind of uh, situation is with printers. Maybe you've bought a printer before at Walmart and you thought, wow, how can they sell a printer for $20? You know, I bought a Canon printer. I made a mistake one time. I bought a Canon printer. It was $20. It was great until I needed to buy the ink cartridge for it. And the ink cartridge was about $30 for a $20 printer. So like my variable costs on that were really high. You know, that was an example of alternative one where they sell you the, the printer for cheap, but then the ongoing variable costs are high. In contrast, the printer I have in my office now is a laser printer. And it had a high initial purchase price, but the print per page is very, very low because I just buy, a, I think it's like a $15 toner cartridge and it'll last for 10,000 pages. So the variable costs are very cheap. So which one to purchase depends on how many prints you're going to be making. And it's not always about printers, of course, but in most types of equipment, there's a, a difference in variable costs and a difference in the fixed cost. And which one you choose depends on what your level of production is anticipated to be. 
There's a break-even point here. It's the dividing line between the two alternatives. And once you identify graphically or through spreadsheet calculations when the threshold is between one alternative being cheaper versus the other, then you can compare that break-even point to how many items you expect to make in a given month. Okay, so that's what we're going to do in today's exercise. Um, if you've got your computer, there is a spreadsheet template available for you to download on MU, on, MU Online. You can, it's the last thing in the uh, course content side. It's an Excel file that already has the, uh, the template that's on the back of the page here. So on the back of the page is uh, the blanks. And you're going to go through and solve to find out of option one versus option two, under what circumstances is one of them better than the others? Okay, so what we have is um, two options here, the computer controlled equipment and the manual controlled equipment. You'll notice that the, uh, the first cost of the computer equipment is more expensive. So what do we get for that, uh, you know, that added expense? Well, it lasts longer. It lasts 10 years instead of seven. It has some salvage value, whereas option two, the manually controlled equipment, has no salvage value. Uh, the people don't have to be as skilled to operate it. So the overall labor costs are $180 per hour compared to $195 per hour. And then it's more productive. It can do three units per hour instead of the manual controlled equipment can only do 2.4 units per hour. Okay, one thing I want to mention before you get working on this is if you're in option B, it asks, what if you're going to do a hundred, I'm sorry, a thousand units per year? What you need to calculate is how many hours is it going to take to do that? Because option one is going to take a different amount of time to do it than option two. And your labor costs are based on the number of hours, not necessarily just on the number of units that are being made. All right, so the first step here in part A, capital recovery. Remember, that's the difference between the first cost and the salvage value. And you can find that by uh, using the payment function and putting in both the present value and the future value in the same function. There's other ways to do it, but that's one that we've seen in class before.
Thank you. That will make a difference. There we go. That's more like it. So what this conditional formatting is doing is it's going to bold the one that's cheaper. The better of the two. So option one is more expensive when we're only doing 1,000. But then if we had uh, 3,000 units per year, then suddenly option two is the cheaper alternative. So what we need to do is we need to find out where's the crossover point? Where is it? What's the break even, like the threshold that defines option one being better versus option two being better? So we can calculate the difference. Like if we have the option one minus option two, what we would want to do in goal seek is we want to find out what is the uh, output that will make the difference equal to zero. And so if you go into data, what if analysis, goal seek, what we're going to try and do is we're going to set this difference between the two costs equal to zero by changing the output. So have the difference be equal to zero by changing how many units are being made. And what it'll do is it'll show us that at 2,045.62 units, whatever that means, I guess 2,046 units is where the two are equal. But if we go more than that, for the high volume, option one is better. For low volume, option two is cheaper. 